Hello, everyone. I'm Walter Brennan from EXP, and welcome back to the TEA's Theme Park Design Series. Uh, before we get going, I've got a couple of housekeeping items for you. Uh, number one, this event is being recorded and will be put out on the YouTube channel, so you have been warned. Number two, uh, if you have any questions as we're going through the presentation, feel free to drop them into the chat, and we will answer those at the end. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the purpose of this series is to shine a spotlight on disciplines within the entertainment industry that uh, may not be as well known or understood. And the intent is for students and TEA veterans alike to have a chance to learn more about those disciplines and to basically pull the curtain back a little bit and see some of the magic uh, behind the scenes. So with that, for the next slide, this is the fifth installment of this series. Uh, in the first installment, we learned about landscape architecture and how that really is the first opportunity uh, for the guests to see what this attraction may be about. Uh, it's also the first opportunity to start telling the story of the attraction. Uh, the second uh, installment we had was architecture. And there we learned how the architect really truly is the, the, the master designer. Uh, he is the one in charge of all disciplines as well as their own disciplines. Uh, whether it comes to designing cues or uh, life safety issues and that kind of thing. Uh, in the third installment, we started getting into the world of engineers, uh, specifically structural engineers, and the challenges that they faced with keeping their buildings up and secure and stable. Uh, and then the fourth installment, we covered electrical and how the electrical engineers have a lot of different systems that they deal with uh, providing power and control for. Uh, in this installment, I'm actually super excited about it because this is the first chance I get to tell you guys about my friend Marie Karate and I and what we do on a daily basis in this industry and, and, and what we get to do. Uh, so along with that, I think uh, let's go ahead and, and get into the, the meat of the presentation. Uh, first thing we have to do, though, is we have to thank our sponsor. Uh, EXP was very generous to uh, sponsor this event for us. And without them, Marie and I wouldn't get to do what we do on a daily basis. So with that, let's talk about what we're gonna talk about. This is our agenda. Uh, we're gonna do a couple of quick introductions so you can get to know Marie and I a little bit better. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about what mechanical engineers do, uh, what mechanical engineering is like in themed spaces, and then putting it all together, uh, how we do it all in 3D. Uh, and then at the end, we'll do some questions. So a little bit more about me. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am been with EXP now for 28 years. So all 28 years of my experience in the industry has been with the same company. Uh, along the way, I've worked on projects like Mission Space, Hard Rock Orlando, Toy Story Midway Mania, uh, the Club 33 renovation here at Disneyland Resort, uh, as well as Universal Beijing, which opened uh, almost two years ago now. Uh, in addition to those, we have big projects happening right now that I just can't tell you about. I'm sorry. We, we have confidentiality agreements with a lot of our clients. Uh, in addition to that, I am on the Western Board of the TEA. Um, not only that, but I'm also the Education Committee Chair, and I'm on the Next Gen University Relations uh, Committee. Uh, my degree is from Penn State, is a Bachelor of Architectural Engineering. And my claim to fame is I've been to every Disney resort on the planet. So with that, Marie, why don't you tell us a little bit more about you? Hi, I'm Marie Scotty. I'm a project manager and engineer at EXP. I've been at EXP for 17 years. And some of my favorite projects over those 17 years, one of my earliest theme park projects was uh, Legoland Florida. And changing that from what was Cypress Gardens into Legoland Florida. Uh, the Magic Kingdom Fantasy and Land expansion that included Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. Um, it also included uh, Fairy Tale Hall and relocating the Dumbo Ride, um, Universal Studios, Escape from Green Dots, and, and, and the Hogwarts Hogsmeade Express. Also got to work on Universal Beijing Resort, and uh, one of my latest one projects has been Legoland New York. I graduated from Milwaukee School of Engineering with a Bachelor's of Science in Architectural Engineering. I had a focus on uh, structural and mechanical engineering while I was there. Now, some things people don't know about me in the industry is I'm also a Girl Scout troop leader for both my girls, two different troops. And my claim to fame is I've been riding roller coasters since before I was born. I like to uh, throw some shade on mom there, but uh, maybe uh, 
theme park love is genetic. And we are going to talk about what mechanical engineers do. When we say mechanical engineers, that can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different industries from acoustics, aerospace engineering, uh, nanotechnology, robotics, and manufacturing, biomedical engineering. But specifically today, when we talk about facility engineering, we are talking about heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, plumbing systems, and fire protection. And that's what we mean when we say facility mechanical engineering. So when we talk about uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, we'll often say HVAC for short. Uh, that includes cooling systems, heating systems, ventilation systems, controls. Uh, it could mean a central energy plant. Uh, sometimes it, we dabble in smoke control systems. And the equipment you'll see often in those systems are air handling units and fans, ductwork, dampers, diffusers and grills, pumps, piping and valves. We're also going to talk about the plumbing scope of work. That means uh, cold water and hot water for human use and consumption. Could mean sanitary waste drainage and vent piping, storm drainage, natural gas, compressed air. Those top four, I'll pause there, those top four are some of the most common plumbing systems that you might find in any building. And then when we're working in themed entertainment spaces, the, some of the more fun systems, I call them, could be the gas systems, the compressed air, liquid nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and hydraulic fluid. We're also going to cover a bit of fire protection scope. When we say a mechanical engineer, facility mechanical engineer, those folks will often cover sprinkler piping systems and sprinkler headlamps. Walter is going to talk more about HVAC specifically and mechanical engineering and themed spaces. Absolutely. So under HVAC, we have a lot of different topics and a lot of different systems that we deal with. The first one we're going to talk about is the cooling system choices. So let's get into that. Uh, at the fundamental level, a DX system or direct expansion system is basically what you find in your house. So you have an outdoor unit that's called the condensing unit. You have the indoor unit that's called the evaporator or fan coil unit. And what happens is uh, the air that comes from your house, from your living room, for example, goes into that indoor unit and we take the heat out of the airstream and then we take that heat and run it to the outdoor unit and discharge it to atmosphere. So a misnomer is we don't actually do cooling necessarily, we actually do heat removal. So just think of it that way and you'll understand every system. So another option on the same type of system, DX, is taking the indoor unit and the outdoor unit and putting it into one package that looks like that school bus there on sitting on the roof and in, in gray there. Uh, so it is all in one package. The only thing that goes in and out of that unit is the air to condition the space uh, indoors. Another variation on this system is called the chilled water system. So we have the machines there on the left that make cold water, chilled water, usually in the order between 40 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. That chill water runs to an indoor air healing unit or fan coil unit, uh, which then conditions the space, uh, the indoor space. And because that chill water takes the heat away from the space, the temperature goes up, we bring it back to the chiller and cool it down again. Some terms you might want to know as they relate to chill water systems are like a water cooled chiller, for example, that's what that machine looks like. A cooling tower is what that looks like. And then also an air cooled chiller which does both functions of the water-cooled chiller and the cooling tower together. Uh, in a theme park example, a chilled water system would be centrally located, as indicated in this particular example, with the orange star. Uh, and then with the black lines around the site, we distribute the chilled water to each building that then uses that chilled water to cool the building. Now, similarly to the chill water system, we also have heating systems that we have to use. Uh, the first option for that is electric heat. Uh, basically, it's the same concept as what lives in your toaster, right? It's a little element that we heat up and it radiates to heat the space around it. Uh, in this particular case, this system is most commonly used in theme parks where we have warm locations where the heating season isn't necessarily as long. Uh, another option we have is natural gas heat. So we actually burn natural gas in a heat exchanger and the air passes across the heat exchanger to get heated up before going into your space. 
This is much more common in northern climates where the heating season is a, a larger portion of the year. And then similar to the chilled water system, we also have a hot water system. So we have a central boiler that heats up the water anywhere between 120 and 180 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, runs it through an air handling unit. The heat gets taken off the air handler and dumped into your space so it stays warm. And again, the, the, the hot water gets cooler, so we have to bring it back to the boiler to heat it back up. And in a similar application for a theme park, uh, the orange would be where the boilers are. Black represents the hot water piping as we run it around the site uh, to, to provide heating to every building on the campus. The next topic actually has to do with something that we work with very closely with architects and landscape architects, and that's for hiding our equipment. So for example, this is a, re a themed retail project that we did. Uh, this is the concept art that the, uh, the team came up with. It looks great, nice and clean, but then in reality, there's a whole bunch of equipment on the roof. And the challenge is to hide all that so that we can still do the job it's supposed to do, air condition and heat the building, but the guests never see it. So they use tricks like screen walls and mansard roofs to hide all of our stuff um, so that you never even know that it's there. Uh, the next category is ceiling coordination. And for ceiling coordination, we have a lot of stuff that we have to run above the ceiling. Go ahead and hit the next slide. There you go. Um, it's really, really big. Um, it basically, it's ductwork. So we move air through it at various velocities. Um, sometimes it's rectangular and square. Sometimes it's round. Sometimes it's what we call flat oval, which is a combination of round and square. And sometimes uh, we have to decide what materials we're going to use. So most of the time it's metal. Uh, but there are occasions, especially when they're exposed, that we get to use like fabric ductwork. So that stuff in the lower right-hand corner is actually blue fabric ductwork. So it's, it's very, uh, very cool the different things we can do with it. Uh, and then every once in a while, we get a chance to actually be on stage. So 90% of the time, we're hidden above a ceiling. Uh, but sometimes in a themed environment, when we have to be along the perimeter, for example, with the pictures we see here, uh, because we have to be there anyway, our, our show set friends build our ductwork into the story. So they'll, they'll intentionally age it and make it look like it's been there forever or some fun colors or whatever. Um, so it, it gives us a chance to actually be part of the story. Uh, another topic has to do with diffuser coordination. So diffusers are how the, the heated or cooled air actually gets into the space. And uh, there's lots of different options for it. You've seen it in your classroom, in your office space, those square two by two diffusers there on the left. Uh, if you don't have any ceilings, then you probably see the round ones there in the middle. Uh, we also have sidewall diffusers. Uh, one of the ones we use a lot in the entertainment industry is the linear diffuser there in the lower right, uh, lower left corner. Uh, it allows us to hide the air uh, much more easily than the other previous three. But then there's the last one, which is called a jet diffuser. And that's my favorite because that just, to me, this looks epically cool in a space. Um, as you can see, you know, if you never thought about it, there's no air conditioning in fairy tales. If you're watching a, a, a movie or a TV show. Nobody's talking about the air conditioning system. And that's on purpose. We're, we're definitely behind the scenes. Um, but our goal is to make sure that when we put diffusers in a space that we don't actually like get in the way of the story. Uh, and that involves having to coordinate with the architect and, and show set and hide our stuffs in rock work and, and in like fake beams, as you see in these images here. Um, for the most part, it's working with the show set and the architects to, uh, to make our stuff go away. Speaking of going away, we often get the request to provide invisible HVAC systems. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this is a, a penguin and puffin exhibit at an aquarium. And if you notice, they have this awesome mural behind it to represent the sky. And they actually change the color of the sky depending upon the time of day uh, for the penguins. Uh, and obviously that does not create a place for us to hide any of our diffusers or any of our ductwork. So we have to be creative. And in this particular case, our solution was to bury it in the rockwork so that even though the guests can't see it, they can feel it and the penguins can feel it and they love it. Uh, another 
chance we get every once in a while is to actually be part of the story itself. So in this particular example, we did a, a penguin exhibit that is also a ride. So it's in a warm weather climate, so it's 95 degrees outside. But then when you ride the ride, it's 60 degrees, so it's a little chilly. But then when you get off the ride and you go through the penguin exhibit, it's actually 30 degrees in there. And if you think about it, people are wearing t-shirts and shorts. And the, our goal was to how do we how do we keep people comfortable while being in a 30 degree exhibit like that? And the secret is actually to control the dew point. We'll talk about that some other time. Um, another aspect of this attraction is the fact that penguins themselves, the nastiest smelling things on the planet is penguin guano. So our job is to control the odor within the attraction so it doesn't affect the guest experience. And the way we do that is the diagram in the upper right-hand corner. Um, that's actually an air pressurization diagram. So we control the relative pressure of the air in one space versus another to contain the odors and remove them before they become an impact on the guest experience. So go ahead to the next one. So the last thing I want to mention for mechanical engineering, uh, especially under HVAC, is sustainability. And as many of you may or may not know, HVAC can be as much as 50% of the energy usage of a building. Uh, so that gives us a unique ability to actually impact significantly the amount of energy that a building consumes by using more efficient systems and therefore uh, reducing the carbon effect on the planet. Uh, another thing that's come up recently is a lot of communities are starting to ban natural gas. Uh, and you may be wondering, well, why do we do that? Isn't natural gas a clean burning fuel? Well, no, it's not clean. It's cleaner than other alternatives, but it's still a fossil fuel and it still gives off carbon to the atmosphere. So the way we've been dealing with that is, is going all electric and using a lot of heat pumps and heat pump chillers to do what we used to do by burning gas. Uh, one of the other things that's in the news lately that is greatly affected by us is uh, what's called refrigerant phase out. If you remember at the beginning, I talked about using refrigerant to remove heat from one space to another. Well, that refrigerant unfortunately has two components to it. Uh, one is an ozone depletion potential and another is a global warming potential. So for those of you who might be older, you might remember back in the 1990s, we actually went through a whole refrigerant phase out process to get rid of refrigerants that contribute to ozone depletion. We had this huge hole in the ozone layer and it was just getting bigger and we had to do something. So we phased out a whole bunch of refrigerants and now that hole is repairing itself. So the good news is by our actions to get rid of certain refrigerants, we can actually positively affect the environment. Um, now that seems to have gone away and is, is going the right direction to heal itself. The new challenge is what's called global warming potential or GWP. And again, that has to do with how much carbon and how much um, CO2 equivalents end up in the atmosphere. And we are going through it right now where the refrigerants that we use on a daily basis are now starting to get phased out and we have new ones coming in that are much safer and have a lower global warming potential than, than the previous ones. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Marie to talk about plumbing in theme spaces. We're gonna be talking about all these different systems water heating. And these are two examples of tank type water heaters. And we have two options, just like when uh, Walter was discussing for HVAC, we have the option to use electric, or we have the option to use gas. And on the outside, they look very similar, except for that a uh, draft for the flue for the combusted air to escape from the water heater. And uh, we also have an instantaneous option. We would use these where we have less demand for, for hot water. Maybe it's a few sinks, a couple showers, maybe just one sink, and we can put that uh, somewhere remote. But you might be thinking where where are we water heating? I, I'm just thinking about rides. I'm just thinking about shows and and all these cool spaces, meet and greets, et cetera, or things like that. Um, but every theme park map that you pick up, you might look for the, the restaurants and the restrooms. 
Um, there's a lot of hot water use going on with dishwashing and food prep. Um, and there are restrooms peppered throughout the theme parks for guest use, as well as back of house for employee restrooms and locker rooms uh, or showers and back of house spaces for, for show performers. Uh, under the mechanical engineering scope of work, a plumbing designer might also be concerned about uh, water quality. Uh, we call it potable or drinkable water. The incoming water can oftentimes have minerals and bacteria, salt or, or suspended materials. Um, we look at the hardness of the water and all of that can go into ruining equipment like water heaters, kitchen equipment, um, misting machines, Water machines or any other special effects. And we would treat that water with a water softeners and sometimes reverse osmosis systems that we need to size and select. And we also take a look at protecting the water source. Uh, backflow preventers will prevent any contamination upstream of them from getting sucked back into the public waterway. If there was a change of pressure and there happens to be any contamination, Inside the building, we don't want to get that into the public water source and pass along to other buildings or properties. Uh, in theme parks, though, you're not going to see them very often outside. It might be back backstage, back of house. You would see this uh, red one, usually painted red, so that you know that it's for fire protection, and the blue one, usually painted uh, for domestic water. Um, but most of the times, we in theme parks, you know, particularly if we have a building in the middle of a theme park. We're going to try to hide them inside out of guest view and particularly if you're working in a northern climate you want to hide them in the door so that they don't freeze um, the smaller one on the right might be used upstream of a specific piece of equipment uh, maybe it's a 3d eyeglass machine or a dishwasher or water filtration system and you want to make sure any contamination that might be happening upstream of that doesn't get siphoned back into the drinking water in the rest of the building. Plumbing engineers are also responsible for roof drainage and overflow drains. Uh, these are roof drains up on roofs, the top two on the left and the bottom on the left. And oftentimes they can get clogged up with plant material, um, Anything that might have just flown away from a guest in a in a breeze could land up on a roof and could clog a roof drain. So our codes require that we provide some sort of overflow, overflow or um, emergency drain. And that could be a scupper nearby through the parapet wall, like you see on the bottom left, or it could be an entirely separately piped system like the middle drains here. It has a little uh, ring around it to Make sure that most of the water is going through the primary drain and the secondary drain only sees it if once it gets backed up. And then we have to try to make sure that that gets piped somewhere where someone's going to see it on the ground level. Uh, the maintenance staff person who's going to know that if we see lots of excess water coming out of one of those downspout nozzles on the right, that they uh, need to go check on the roof. We want to make sure that water is not. Uh, collecting up there because the structural engineer only planned for a certain amount of water. Um, we don't want to, to overwhelm that structure. So now we get to talk about some of the more, I mean, all of that was fun, but we get to talk about some of the more fun and special effects systems that the plumbing uh, designers get to work on when we talk about mechanical engineering. Flame effects. Uh, we use natural gas and liquid propane to mix those together and create these big yellowy balls of flame. Um, you can't just use natural gas. If you have a gas burner stove at home, you'll see that that just burns blue and that's not very visible during a, a daytime show effect. Uh, the liquid propane is what we really need to mix to get those big colors, but it takes a lot to store that um, and a lot of space. So mix them together and we get these balls of fire. And we also get to deal with the fog effects. Um, fog effects are often done using carbon dioxide or liquid nitrogen. Now these are classified as like cryogenic liquids. They're very, very cold. They're often, um, most of the time, 
transported through vacuum sealed piping, um, a really specialized uh, piping and field. Um, a lot of times as a plumbing or mechanical engineer for the facility, we'll work with the provider of these systems uh, to lay them out because um, they'll have special requirements. Um, but we mix CO2 and dry ice to make the low lying creeping fog effects. And then we use compressed air and LN2 to make the large explosions of fog that'll fill up a whole room really quickly. Um, and then it's the HVAC designer's job to get rid of it really quickly for the next show. And compressed air is the next system I wanna talk about. You may, if you hear the word pneumatics, we're talking about compressed air. Um, not all break blocks use compressed air, some are magnetic, but a lot of roller coasters use pneumatic brakes. Um, these brakes will be in the station, they might be on the lift hill. If you're out running, if it's a longer coaster course, they might be mid course uh, in case there's a break that just needs to slow the coaster down or have an emergency stop in case there's pro a problem with a car in front of it. And then there's end breaks right before we come back into the station. We also use compressed air on round rides. Uh, they either will bring the center uh, um, figure up and down, or they'll be responsible for individual ride motion of the individual arms. And we use compressed air for station gates. There'll be a set of very small valves and very small pneumatic tubing right under the post for each gate. Um, and a little bit of air pushes the, the nozzle one way to open and the other way to close. And somewhere there is a receiver tank holding a lot of air in pent up pressure to do that very quickly so you can get on and off to ride quickly. And we've already talked about how compressed air is used for fog blasts when we were talking about fog, but it's also used for water blasts. So it will be a what we'll call a water cannon just under the surface of the water and it will let the water flow into it. There'll be a, a valve holding back a pent up amount of pressure of compressed air. And if you've seen those little totems where you can go by and by the press of a button and splash the riders as they go by, you're just quickly releasing the contact to release that valve and blow all that water uh, out of the cannon and onto the gas. So we also use show compressed air for animated figures. They could be used for small movements within a, in a animated figure, maybe a head twitch or a nose wiggle, blinking eyes, a move of an arm. And it can also be used to pressurize inside of the figures if they're uh, got the projection surface inside them. It keeps heat from building up within the char character and overheating. And the last system for plumbing we're going to talk about is hydraulic fluid. These can be used when we need a lot more power, a lot more pressure, or maybe we need a smoother movement in those animated figures or their larger animated figures. We'll use hydraulics. Uh, and also some rides will use hydraulic fluids just like they use compressed air in the same manner, but maybe they just need more pressure because these systems can contain 3,000 to 5,000 PSI. Uh, hydraulic fluid. When we're talking about hydraulic fluids, we're talking about oil. Um, sometimes, most of the time, it's kind of like a food grade oil, or sometimes it's a, more of a mechanical oil, but it just keeps things running. The next topic we're going to drop in on is fire protection. So let's talk about some of the basics. What is fire protection when you're talking to a facility mechanical engineer? And, and how does it work? It's not like in the movies. Uh, heat will rise up to the sprinkler and it'll cause it to activate. And then the water will flow. Only the sprinklers that are activated by heat will have uh, water flowing. It's not like movies where someone sets off one and the whole floor is doused in water or the whole building is raining down water and the, and the main characters running through the building getting soaking wet. Uh, and it's not pulling the fire alarm and setting off all the sprinklers. The fire alarm will not set off the sprinklers. Uh, where do we need fire protection and why do we use it? The purpose of a fire protection system is to allow guests 
and occupants to egress safely from the building. It buys them time to get out of the building and, and it slows down the progression of the fire. It also maintains the level of the fire until the fire department arrives. So it tries to keep the integrity of the building until help can come. It's not gonna save the entire building. It's not gonna save all the contents of the building or a room, um, but it could help um, with ma massive damage. Um, the National Fire Protection Association tells us when and where and how to design fire protection systems. And insurance companies will often tell owners where they need the sprinkler system and why they need sprinkler systems and some of their special requirements. So what many of the guests see first, or if they see them, we try to hide them, uh, are the sprinklers. So this, if you're not familiar with sprinklers, this is probably what you've maybe seen. You've maybe seen any number of these types of sprinklers in several buildings. We have all sorts of options and configurations from pendant to upright and sidewall. We all often try to use the concealed uh, versions. That's just a flat plate. It can be ordered in a variety of colors to try to match the theming. We'll try to use extended coverage sprinklers so that we can use less of them. And then we have a couple different options between fusible link and glass bulbs. And they have many different ratings for different temperatures. Um, you know, if we have a, a heat effect somewhere, we're gonna wanna make sure that that sprinkler is not gonna inadvertently break when there's not really a fire. We just have a heat um, effect going on. And there are many different types of sprinkler systems. The two most common would be the wet pipe and the dry pipe system and kind of sounds exactly like their name. The wet pipe is full of water all the time. When that sprinkler pops and, break, and the link breaks, water comes out immediately. Uh, in the dry pipe system though, the pipe is usually filled with compressed air and it will hold back the water closer to the riser. And when the sprinkler pops, the loss of air pressure allows the water to flow out through the sprinkler. We use that mostly where we're gonna be concerned about freezing and we don't want the water in the pipe to freeze, uh, block up the water and not allow that sprinkler system to work the way it should. And there are a lot of different types of sprinklers. Um, other than this, we have pre-action, deluge, a bunch of different agents, um, misting and foaming systems. We have a picture here of the foaming system. Um, it's just kind of a fun picture. You can go check out a lot of videos on it. Uh, but you wouldn't use that in a theme park uh, application. We wouldn't want to douse all of those um, expensive show sets and figures and AV equipment with, with foam. Um, also, last thing I want to touch here on fire protection is some of the creative coordination that we've got to watch out for when we're laying out sprinkler heads. Um, Walter showed, you know, just like with the grills and diffusers, we've got to look out for what's on the ceiling. We've got to watch out for the, the chandeliers. We've got to watch out for the faux beams. Uh, you can see, if you look real closely on the bottom left, that the, you, you can see the concealed head painted brown in one of those faux beams. Um, so we gotta look out for those. Uh, we also have to work around rock work. Uh, that, that's one of the trickier ones because there's no, it's not a flat ceiling. We can't evenly measure the spacing or, but we have to stay within 12 inches of the top. Um, and we have these alcoves. Uh, when I say 12 inches, I mean from the, from the top of that ceiling or top of any structure. That's where the sprinklers need to be. So uh, the last example I have here is uh, some obstructions and lighting trusses. Those are some of the things we need to coordinate around. Uh, if it's bigger than four feet, your fire protection engineer is going to try to talk to you about how can we get a sprinkler underneath that? How can we spray underneath it if it's bigger than four feet? Um, on that picture on the right, that is a full-size tractor that's got to be sprinklered around. And then on the, on the bottom, we, we've got a prop cannon. 
that you know, conversation had to be, do we go through the middle of it or can we spray underneath it elsewhere? And Walt is going to talk about putting it all together in 3D. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, everything we, we just covered, we actually model completely in a virtual environment before anybody starts to build it. So as you'll see on the next slide, this is an example of that. Uh, this is actually a 3D model that was generated uh, for a particular attraction. And this is what the end result looks like. Uh, but we actually start with the ride system. So the stuff on the inside there in yellow is actually the ride track, which also includes like a reach envelope, meaning uh, where the riders can stick their arms out or up. Uh, that envelope or that radius, we have to maintain clearance so that nobody hits their hand through the ride as they're going through or their head or whatever. Um, the next thing we do is we overlay the, uh, the show set on top of that. So the show set is literally all the uh, scenery that you see as you're going through the ride, uh, which we then have to coordinate our systems with. So as you'll see in this image here, uh, the stuff in red is the mechanical systems. Uh, the stuff in blue are the fire protection systems. And the stuff in green are our plumbing systems. And that ultimately is our goal, is to coordinate all that uh, to be completely uh, clash free and that way, when the contractor goes to build it, uh, they don't have uh, too many issues during construction. So you may be wondering, how do we do all that? And, and the system that we use most of the time is called Autodesk Revit. Um, if you have an interest in getting into this type of thing, Revit is the best place to start. Uh, it is literally the 3D, what's, what's known as BIM information modeling. Uh, but the 3D tool that we use to generate all these systems. Um, in addition to that, we also look to uh, other organizations like ASHRAE and ASPE and NFPA. Um, ASHRAE is the American Society of Heating, Ventilating, uh, uh, sorry, Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Um, ASPE is the American Society of Plumbing Engineers. And as Marie noted before, NFPA is the National Fire Protection Association. So these organizations will establish standards and guidelines for uh, any different type of system that you wanna put in a building, um, they set the standard for that. Uh, some other tools that we use a lot of, uh, of course, Microsoft Excel, we are engineers, so we do a lot of calculations. Um, we also use Bluebeam a lot, that helps us communicate concepts and ideas uh, with our architects and, and show creative people. And then another, for, another software we use is HydraTech, which is uh, for our fire protection engineers to run their calculations with. So with that, I think we're gonna open it up for questions and answers. Uh, so make sure you use the chat feature in Zoom to ask any questions that you have. Um, I see we have one question so far and maybe Marie, you and I can both answer it. Uh, the question is, do you have clients that specific sustainable that have specific sustainable goals like lead or living building? Um, the answer to that is yes, we do. Um, it, it's very rare to find an entertainment client that wants to pursue lead though. Uh, and the reason for that is it lead originally was was designed and and organized as if uh, it was being applied to an office building. And then all the other types of buildings, have adopted ways to uh, to get certified through it. Uh, the tricky part with the theme park industry is we have a lot of um, energy intensive uses, whether it's a ride system or show lighting or that type of thing uh, that makes lead really hard to get certification with. Um, but the good news is the clients that we work with, the, the big theme park operators, all are hypersensitive to sustainability. So they've all come up with their own sustainability goals and their own metrics and point systems uh, that's more customized to what they do. And by doing that, um, they are able to be as sustainable as possible uh, in all the different aspects of their, of their um, operations. Marie, did you have anything to add to that? I, I was going to chime in on many of them that are creating their own standards or have their own goals. Um, you know, they'll, they are trying to monitor 
uh, and meter what they're using and finding ways to uh, tabulate and compare those to how they were doing before and come up with ways that they can be more sustainable. Um, I would say, I mean, even this 18, or I mean, eight or 10 years ago, I was working on a theme park project where they, we wanted to use reclaimed water for flushing the toilets. So it's not it's not brand new to the theme park. You know, they're not, never say never. They're not, they're not that they're not doing it. It's just like Walter said, that there's not a lead theme park category per se. So they have had to come up with their own ways to be sustainable. Exactly. Okay. Uh, the next question, I'm going to direct to you, Marie, to see if you have any stories to share before I share mine. Um, okay. The question is, do you have any examples of unique conflicts between show design and the physical reality of facility equipment, and how was it solved? Well, we, so we have, um, I think with ours, you know, there's always, and we shared rock work, and, and rock work is a, is a particularly tricky one. Um, trying to do that in 3D before you're actually trying to build it, it is tough for modeling fire protection. And uh, one of the first rock work projects I had, there was a model studio, and they were taking 3D scans of that, and we were putting it into 3D AutoCAD. We weren't even in Revit yet for that project. Um, so trying to do that and then just trying to be flexible. Uh, I try to share with you know, our younger staff, it's gonna change and you know, expect changes even when you think you're done. You know, draw, I try to explain a couple of times to, to some of the folks from work, I'm probably gonna draw it twice, maybe three times until we get it right. Um, and I expect that because it's gonna be iterations. I'm gonna have to be flexible to show that it, worst case scenario is going to have to be flexible, but we'll do everything we can to make it work. Cool. Yeah, my experience, uh, especially on on uh, physical unique conflicts, actually has to do with rock work as well. Uh, the tricky part is rock work um, isn't necessarily something that gets figured out ahead of time. It kind of evolves. Um, you start with certain planes. And then uh, as, as the design continues, even though we're building <laughs> the facility, uh, the design of the rock work continues to evolve. And ultimately, you end up with, with odd, um, like concave areas or hollow areas, and you have to add in sprinkler heads that you weren't planning on. So the good news is what we try to do is uh, during the, the purchasing of the contracts for the, for the facilities, they put in a certain number of extra sprinkler heads so that um, we know it's coming. We just don't know how many of those we're going to need. Um, so it's built into the flexibility of, of uh, how we purchase uh, the system materials. Um, okay. Some of the other things like, um, like ductwork clashes, the good news is ductwork is big enough that you can see it ahead of time. Uh, but again, sometimes the show set doesn't get fully developed at the same time. Uh, so then you end up with conditions in the field that you have to coordinate how to reroute some duct work to, to work better with the show set. I was going to say, you and I both used uh, rock work and fire protection as an example, but if I think back to my first project that had rock work, my challenge was we were trying to put roof drains in the rock work. And so there were all these little gullies and uh, goat paths to try to catch some of that rain before it got to the landscaping down below yep. on a big mountain so that was that was interesting yeah well that's a good point too actually because we do a lot of uh like fake mountains and ultimately there's a building that lives underneath it so you have to accommodate for the fact that the fake mountain isn't waterproof so you end up with rainwater like in places you didn't expect mm -hmm. um so the next question, and I'll jump with this one, and then Marie, you can tag on there if you want. Uh, what is the unexpected knowledge or skill you use every day that was not part of your formal education? That's a great question, Jeff Crocker. Thank you for asking. Um, there is a lot of skills that you learn after graduating college that you didn't even know you didn't know. Um, a lot of them have to do with 
people skills. And fundamentally, we are an organization of people. And uh, but from a design standpoint, I would say from a design standpoint, the skill of of being able to read other people's drawings and realizing, especially in themed entertainment, that things are not rectangular, they're not symmetrical. Um, there literally is almost no case where you're always going to be able to run straight with conduit or pipe or whatever ductwork. Um, there's always extra elbows to get around something, and the ability to say, okay. Uh, we think this is the way it's going to go, but we're going to add some safety factor into our calculations to make sure that if it doesn't go that way and it goes that way, uh, we can account for that and have it covered. There's a lot of um, safety factors that go into what we do. Marie, I don't know if you have anything to add on to that. Um, I, was trying to be, I mean, communication is something that's kind of probably part of every every course in some way, and note taking is a part of every course in some way, but some of our projects are, are quick hitters and some of them last years and years. And there's no, I, I didn't take any specific note taking course, but being able to record thoughts and, and remember things over the course of a project is just a skill that I feel like has developed over the years since college. I, I know you, you take notes, but like, no one's teaching you exactly how to take notes. A professor might have a specific way they, they want you to take notes, but being able to come up with your own system to be able to record your thoughts in a way that other people can find them and access them and agree with them has been is a is this just skill a people skill that one hones in this industry for sure. Yep, definitely. Finding a way to track all the all the open issues, closed issues. Definitely the soft skills. There's, there's not a lot of soft skill taught in engineering school, for sure. Uh, maybe that's because engineers tend not to be type A personalities. <laughs> I would say at one point it was customer service. Yeah. Like a, the customer service skills is, yep. is something that's not necessarily an engineering course. For sure. And de definitely the business skills. You're right. Uh, so let's see, the next question I'm going to direct to you, Marie. Um, in terms of HVAC systems and devices, do you find yourself designing custom devices such as air conditioners or more, find ways to implement standard devices from companies? I tend to try to go for standard devices that will fit into what we're doing. If there's something that we can find off the shelf that works, I would prefer. I would propose that first. Uh, it's not to say that we haven't had custom, you know, grills and diffusers that just look better in the space or because someone in the creative and architectural realm thought it would look like something and we figure out that, yes, we can use that. Um, but we try to do off the shelf as much as possible so that most of the budget can go to the prettier stuff. Well, that's a good point too. Uh, the, the, there's another reason for that, and that is from a maintenance standpoint. Um, all of our attractions are living, breathing facilities. And the more customized the equipment you use, um, the more customized the parts are to repair them. And from an operator standpoint, they want as, as much off the shelf product as possible so that when they need to order a replacement part, um, it's very easy to find and they can keep it in stock. Um, I will say we do, because we do so much work in the entertainment industry, we get in some really cool, unique situations. And I have uh, a lot of manufacturers actually in Germany and in Europe that do very custom diffusers. Uh, and of course, we get them in metric and we have to convert them to, um, to imperial. Uh, but then ultimately, you know, it's the perfect match for the, the, the scene that we're trying to put it in. Okay, let's see. Next one. Uh, this one says, what's a good company in the Los Angeles area to look into to get into this field as a fellow mechanical engineer? Well, good news is Nathaniel Brown, you're talking to him. EXP has an LA office. So we are definitely someone that we can try. Uh, if you're local, you know, we can have you come by the office and even just talk about things in the industry as a whole. But um, there are others out there that, that do a good job with it. And 
I would say um, hmm, some of them are big and some of them are small. Um, and it, without giving you a detailed list of who they are, I would I would go to the TEA website um, and see what kind of mechanical engineers are involved uh, on their list. And uh, and again, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help you uh, reach out to others as well. Okay, next question. Um, let's. <laughs> uh, think. Oh, here we go. Uh, this one's for you, Marie. As I am finishing up a mechanical engineering Bachelor of Science, do you have any advice for focusing my education to align with a career in the themed entertainment world? Definitely. Similar, it's similar to what you were just saying. You go to the CA website and find some companies that are already involved in, in TEA and try to reach out, see if they have internships. Um, if you're not yet finished with your if, with your degree, um, you're still working on it and you want to see if that's the right path. If, if you are um, finished with your degree, it, it's still worth a shot to go to any of those companies to, to see if they have openings. Um, I would without knowing exactly what that degree entails and all those classes, it's, it's kind of hard, but I would, you know, like Walter had on our last screen is, you know, make sure you're taking some sort of uh, Revit or drafting or AutoCAD class, taking uh, any sort of uh, plans, reading courses. Um, if you can find, there's webinars out there um, for all types of, HVAC and plumbing and fire protection webinars. Um, Google, you know, Google and YouTube are are good for just you know if you have questions. Um, what is this? What is that? Um, finding those questions and answers out there. So a couple of suggestions I have because um, obviously with a mechanical engineering degree, uh, there's there's all kinds of the basic core coursework that you have to do, whether it's thermodynamics as suggested uh, or therm um, fluid flow, uh, statics and dynamics, all those important core classes. I was gonna suggest uh, to, to first of all, get really involved in the TEA. So the Themed Entertainment Association uh, has some great events all year round, whether it's in November at IAPA or at the, um, the TEA summit that typically occurs in April or at the SAIT conference, where this year it's in uh, Kansas City in uh, October. So those three events are great networking ability to, to meet people in the industry. And uh, whoever you meet, you just tell them your story, and they're happy to help you figure out uh, how, to, how to not only customize your, your education, but also you know, where to find companies potentially do internships with. Um, if I were you, I'd look for companies uh, during your summer opportunities to have interns with, um, because that's where you really learn the industry that that they do um, before you even get a chance to graduate. Um, to continue that, the TEA does have uh, student club um, committees. So they have TEA clubs at, I think they're up to 45 different schools. Uh, so you could definitely check out the, your local TEA club uh, cause they do very specific activities within the themed entertainment industry. And again, that just gives you more experience, um, as, as someone who, someone who recruits and hires engineers, uh, there's definitely a differentiator between, uh, a mechanical engineering candidate, uh, and a mechanical engineering candidate that has theme park exposure or has theme park passion. Uh, that's something that I look for because it is, it's not your typical type of project. And I think it's it's definitely a, definitely a differentiator. Uh, and then the question was the, uh, the the expos are definitely available on the teaconnect.org uh, website that you can see there at the bottom of the slide. And definitely check that out. Uh, and hopefully we'll see some of you uh, at the next event. So I think that's it for questions. Uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up and I, I appreciate everybody's time.
And hopefully, again, we'll see you at the next TEA event. So take care and have a great year. Everyone.